the world's most powerful particle accelerator, will reopen today after three years of being shut down for improvements. While traditional particle accelerators are huge, expensive, and confined to elite research institutions, the University of Texas in Austin is breaking the trend. Unlike the Large Hadron Collider, this extraordinarily small particle accelerator will shake up the world of particle physics, beating the limitations of the past and revolutionizing the future of scientific exploration. Join us as we explore this miniature marvel as it just achieved a major energy milestone. The Laser Wakefield Accelerator A team of researchers, primarily from the University of Texas at Austin, alongside national labs, European universities, and TAU Systems Inc., have developed a compact particle accelerator just under 20 meters long. This accelerator can produce a high-energy electron beam of 10 billion electron volts, making it one of the only three particle accelerators in the United States to produce energy levels about three kilometers long. In the experiments, researchers generated an electron beam with an energy of 10 billion electron volts in a chamber that measured just 10 centimeters. Bjorn Manuel Hegelich, the senior author of this study, and an associate professor of physics at the University of Texas, talked about the significance of this innovation called an advanced laser wake field accelerator. He said it opens up possibilities for testing space electronics radiation resistance, imaging new semiconductor chip designs, and exploring cancer therapy and advanced medical imaging applications. This innovation is a scientific marvel after decades of research. History of the Laser Wakefield Accelerator the idea of laser wakefield accelerators was first brought to light in 1979. Laser wakefield acceleration was seen as a way to make large accelerators and radiation sources smaller than they could fit in a room. The gradients produced by this accelerator are much higher than those produced in traditional radio frequency accelerators. Experiments with LWFA began in the late 1990s and the first quasi-monoenergetic electron bunches were produced in 2004. Then, the laser wakefield accelerator involved the interaction of lasers with gas to accelerate electrons. However, maintaining the stable performance of the accelerator from shot to shot proved to be a challenge because small changes in laser and gas conditions caused fluctuations in the accelerated electron beam. But now, new methods, such as ionization and fast down ramps, have controlled this instability, but they also have ups and downs. For the ionization injection method, electrons are injected into the NPW using nanoparticles. Recent research has shown that nanowires and nanoparticles can trigger electron injection and increase charge density. In this method, nanoparticles are generated through laser ablation of a metal surface in a gas cell and mixed with helium gas. However, the timing of this injection can also not be controlled due to the random distribution of nanoparticles. Even though using an aerodynamic lens for this method could provide better control, it would require a lot of resources, which beats the aim of creating this particle accelerator. Experimental Setup The arrangement for this experiment includes a gas cell, a magnet, and two special screens called DRZ1, DRZ2, and DRZ3. This setup is inserted in vacuum chambers, and lasers and electron bunches move. A mirror focuses the powerful laser pulses into a short gas cell filled with pure helium and aluminum nanoparticles. The laser ionizes the gas by creating a plasma with a specific electron density. Simultaneously, the laser pulse accelerates electrons to high energy under specific conditions. A magnet then guides the electron bunches and can be detected on three screens at different distances within the gas cell. These multiple screens would help determine the electron energy spectra. However, the electron beam spread can affect the measurement. The DRZ3 screen detects high energy electrons above 2 giga electron volts, while DRZ1 and DRZ2 detect high energy electrons above 0.4 giga electron volts. This imaging plate and cross correlation coupled with the light emitted by the screens, help calibrate the electron charge. How powerful is the laser that's being used? The Texas Petawatt Lasers The Texas Petawatt Laser can create pulses of energy that are 1,000 times more than the electricity produced in the United States, but the pulse only lasts 135 femtoseconds. 
A large portion of this pulse is concentrated on a specific area, and this is possible because a special mirror is used to focus the laser on that spot with a very high intensity. The length of the Texas petawatt laser in a vacuum is about 1.5 centimeters. The difference in brightness of the laser is high, and even several tens of picoseconds before the main pulse. Gas target and nanoparticle source. The gas target is designed based on the slit cell design, but has some changes. This gas target has a removable metal plate at the bottom of the gas cell that helps create tiny particles. The gas cell has windows on the side and top to align the laser and see what happens inside. They fill the gas target with helium using a valve that opens for 2 milliseconds. With a delay of 27 milliseconds before the main laser comes in, they monitor the gas density using a special tool in the middle of the gas cell wall. This laser can create tiny particles through a process known as laser ablation. These particles then mix with helium gas and fill the gas cell evenly. The Texas petawatt laser enters the gas cell through a small hole and generates electrons that pass through another small hole. An extra laser pulse is occasionally used before the main laser to create particles. These particles type, size, and density affect the amount of charge generated. An aluminum plate was used for this experiment, but other metals can be used. General application of particle accelerators. Particle accelerators, like the laser Wakefield accelerator, are primary in particle physics. The biggest accelerator for now is the Large Hadron Collider, which is situated in Geneva, Switzerland, and is operated by CERN. The LHC functions as a collider accelerator. It propels two proton beams to an energy level of 6.5 tetraelectron volts and causes the collision of particles to generate center of mass energies that reach 13 tetraelectron volts. Other potent accelerators are the RHIC, at Brookhaven National Laboratory in New York and the Tevatron at Fermilab in Batavia, Illinois, which is no longer functioning. Outside the field of physics, accelerators are used to investigate condensed matter physics. Particle accelerators also help treat cancer, produce radioisotopes for medical diagnostics, implant ions in semiconductors, and measure rare isotopes like radiocarbon. How does the Laser Wakeford Accelerator differ from other electrostatic accelerators. Accelerators can be grouped into two main categories, electrostatic and electrodynamic. The Laser Wakefield Accelerator is an electrostatic accelerator. This type of accelerator was the earliest form of the accelerator. Other types function just like the Laser Wakefield Accelerator, but they do not use nanoparticles and produce just low energy due to practical voltage limitations. The practical voltage limit for air-insulated machines is around 1 megavolt and 30 megavolts when the accelerator's tank is pressurized with gas with high dielectric strength, like sulfur hexafluoride. The electrical potential is applied twice in tandem accelerators to enhance the particle's acceleration. This process works by reversing the charge of particles within the terminal. The produced beam then passes through a thin foil and causes the removal of electrons from the anions inside the high-voltage terminal and converting them into cations. These cations are once again accelerated as they leave the terminal. There are two main types of electrostatic accelerators. They are the Cockcroft-Walton accelerator, which uses a diode capacitor voltage multiplier for high-voltage generation. Then, the Van de Graaff accelerator utilizes a moving fabric belt to move charges to the high-voltage electrode. Electrodynamic Conductors Before the development of the Laser Wakefield Accelerator, electrodynamic accelerators were used to generate higher energy levels for particle acceleration. Unlike the Laser Wakefield Accelerator, dynamic field techniques are instead used in this type of accelerator. Electrodynamic acceleration can be obtained from either non-resonant magnetic induction or cavities excited by oscillating radio frequency fields. Electrodynamic accelerators can be linear or circular. Magnetic induction. Accelerators induce particles with an increasing magnetic field and treat the particles like they are the secondary winding in a transformer. The growing magnetic field generates a circulating electric field configured to accelerate the particles. Induction accelerators come in linear or circular varieties. While linear induction accelerators use ferret-loaded non-resonant induction cavities, 
Every cavity has two large washer-shaped discs connected by an outer cylindrical tube with a ferret toroid between them. The voltage pulse between the discs induces an increasing magnetic field that couples power into the charged particle beam. This accelerator was invented in the 1960s by Christophilos. It can achieve high beam currents greater than 1,000 amperes in a single short pulse. They generate X-rays for flash radiography and magnetic confinement fusion and are used as drivers for free electron lasers. Betatrons are circular magnetic induction accelerators invented by Donald Kirst in 1940. They are similar to synchrotrons. Using a ring magnet cyclically increases the magnetic field but induces acceleration from the changing magnetic flux through the orbit. Maintaining a constant orbital radius while providing the necessary accelerating electric field ensures that the magnetic flux linking the orbit is somewhat independent of the magnetic field on the orbit. Betatrons have been limited by radiative losses suffered by electrons moving at nearly the speed of light in a relatively small radius orbit. On the other hand, linear accelerators propel particles in a straight line towards the target of interest. This accelerator usually gives particles an initial low-energy boost before injecting them into the circular accelerators. The Stanford Linear Accelerator, measuring 3 km long, is the world's longest linear accelerator. Initially designed to act as an electron-positron collider, SLAC now operates as an X-ray free electron laser facility. High-energy linear accelerators use a linear array of plates with an alternating high-energy field. As particles approach a plate, they are attracted by an opposite polarity charge applied to the plate. Passing through a hole in the plate, the polarity switches, and the plate now repels the particles, accelerating them towards the next plate. Linear accelerators are widely used in medicine for radiotherapy and radiosurgery, producing a reliable, flexible, and accurate radiation beam. In circular accelerators, particles travel in a circle until they reach the desired energy level. Electromagnets bend the particle track into a circle, and the ring topology allows continuous acceleration. Although circular accelerators are smaller than linear accelerators of comparable power, they suffer from the emission of synchrotron radiation, particularly in high-energy applications. The radiation results from charged particles continuously emitting electromagnetic radiation as they accelerate towards the center of the circular path. The brains behind the innovation. The main authors of the study are Konstantin Anikulayase and Tan Ha. Anikulayase is now working at Heinrich Heine University in Germany, while Ha is a doctoral student at UT and is also involved with TAU Systems. Other UT professors involved in the research are Todd Dittmir and Michael Downer. Hegelik and Anikulayase have applied for a patent for the device and the method used to create nanoparticles in a gas cell. TAU Systems, which originated from Hegelik's lab, has an exclusive license for this foundational patent from the university. As part of the deal, UT has received shares in TAU Systems. Funding for this research came from various sources, including the U.S. Air Force Office of Scientific Research, the U.S. Department of Energy, the UK Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, and the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program. Let's hear your thoughts in the comments about this invention. Also, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel for more. See you soon.